Hi, this is Lisa here with Grimoire of Horror, and today we have the honor of interviewing Richard Chismar regarding his latest novel, Chasing the Boogeyman. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Oh, thanks for asking me. Absolutely. We know you've been so busy with your 31 Days of October Madness and the daily video updates. Those have been so fun to see. That's been crazy. Uh, no one talked me out of doing that, which they probably should have. But uh, but yeah, I, I've been enjoying it and people seem to enjoy it. It's been really fun seeing all the locations from the novel, having you walk around there. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about the 31 Days of October? Um, I just wanted to do something that was kind of interactive um to uh you know i mean the boogeyman came out in the middle of august and it's still doing really well it's still like top 500 on amazon and and uh a bunch of reorders going on in the chain store so i kind of wanted to, to to keep up the promoting side of it uh for simon and schuster um you know they've been really good to me and, and i i feel you know indebted to them and i feel responsible you know to to doing whatever i can to help the book so i figured uh you know, it would definitely have some legs for October and Halloween. Um, so I was trying to think of something that I could kind of do daily. And this this idea kind of came full blown. And so I had a graphic made for it and I sent it to the publicist, my editor, my agent, all, you know, everyone at Simon Schuster. And I was like, am I crazy? And I, I was halfway thinking that someone would talk me out of it, but uh, no one did. So therefore every day we offer a new you know a new giveaway for uh, like a bonus gift for anyone who orders the book we do weekly ones for everyone who's ordered it even in the past and then i'm posting these daily uh videos um you know some of them so far most of them have been providing background in edgewood in my my old hometown um about chasing the boogeyman and uh, people really seem to enjoy that but I've got some guests lined up to who will kind of come on, you know, later in the month and uh, do some book reviews and some movie reviews. So, yeah, it's been fun. I mean, it's been it's kept me busy. Um, you know, even just the logistics of, of, you know, making sure everything stays organized and I don't forget anyone who, you know, who slipped in and ordered the book at 1150, you know, at night just before the deadline, that kind of thing. But yeah, yeah, it's been good. And, uh, I, you know, I enjoy hanging out with with all the readers. So it's been a fun way to do that. You, you've been so active with all your fans. It's been really cool to see and um, Chasing the Boogeyman is a really unique book and you're a really unique author for being so active in Facebook and a lot of people know you as the founder of Cemetery Dance Publications and um, what I loved about Chasing the Boogeyman is it almost reads like a memoir but you added a villain to the story and such a unique yeah. idea. I appreciate that. I, I it, it was totally you know, a lot of people have said, was that your plan from the beginning? And it was totally kind of an accident. You know, I, I when I started the book with that introduction, um, I was halfway through and, and, you know, I mean, it might be like an eight page introduction. So I, maybe I was on page four or five and I realized that, OK, I'm going to have to write about me. And so I went back to the beginning and I changed it from, you know, this this yet to be named, uh, you know, first person narrator to this is my story because, you know, everything that I was pointing towards um, as far as it being my hometown and the age and the fact that it, that with the exception of the murders that all really happened to me, um, I just realized I wasn't gonna be able to fake it not being me well enough. So that's where that came from. And uh, yeah, so it, it, it was kind of a unique opportunity to write about my own memories and, and, uh, and interweave them with a, you know, a fiction, fictionalized story. I, I was pretty firmly convinced the entire novel was fact until it was explained at the end. It was, it was all so believable. And I wanted to ask you a little bit more about um, the beginning of your career with Cemetery Dance. And you had talked about packing up issues in your garage with um, your dad. And yeah, yeah. Um... Yeah, I mean, everything I wrote about in the book, you know, as far as the beginning was true, I started taking submissions that summer of 88, uh, you know, way back in, in the ancient days before there was the internet and email and all that. And, um, you know, the first issue came out in December, the second issue came out that next summer um, of 89, because we came out twice a year for the first couple of years, and, and then we went to quarterly. Um, but yeah, it, it was just, it was an interesting time. There were, there were dozens of small press magazines, Twilight Zone magazine still existed. 
uh, Night Cry, The Horror Show, Omni Magazine was in print. Um, so there were there were so many places you could submit your work to, and it was just like a really fertile time for for creators, both uh, writers and artists. And uh, you know, I plugged my little magazine into it, and uh, just uh, you know, like I said in the book, I never really went and got a job after college. Um, I, uh, I I just worked on the magazine pretty much around the clock in my own stories. And uh, yeah, again, you know, to go back to Boogeyman, it was just neat the way I was able to to weave it in uh, because it was true. I mean, it was no, you know, it didn't take any talent on my part because I was just telling the truth. So it, it was uh, it was an exciting time. It, I can't even imagine how exciting that must have been. Could you tell us back in 1988, could you ever picture where Cemetery, Cemetery Dance is today? You know, that's the thing I didn't have, you know, I, I've always been a big dreamer. And so I, that went into, you know, having the uh, lack of fear and maybe maybe lack of intelligence to start something like that in the first place. I, I tell everyone I was young enough and dumb enough to, to do it. And I was very stubborn, um, didn't mind working hard. Um, but I didn't look too far beyond. I had an idea. I had a vision of what I wanted the magazine to be, but I'm talking more of the contents in between the covers. Um, and then, you know, uh, once we got, once we became established around issue five, you know, I knew I wanted to put us in bookstores on the newsstands. I knew I wanted to have, you know, really good representation in the comic shops, that kind of thing. But, uh, but no, I, I never, you know, looked ahead too far because frankly, you, you know, you're, you're just grinding, you know, you're just trying to get the work done and um, trying to scrape the, the dollars together to keep going for those first, you know, five, 10 years. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I knew it's what I wanted to do with my life. Um, I didn't, I didn't have a backup plan. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, once we started publishing books along with the magazine, um, you know, we really expanded and, uh, you know, it, it became a little bit more financially sound eventually. But those, yeah, this, I always tell people those first 10 years were rough. Um, you had mentioned in the book, there was an original book, Chasing the Boogeyman. It was that I, I was not able to. Find no, it. that was totally fake. That was totally fake. Uh, a very nice woman emailed me two days ago saying she scoured eBay and a books and all these other places and um, couldn't find it. And I was like, ah, I felt bad because I had to tell her, well, that's because I made it up. You know, I uh, it, it was all like within the framework of, of how I, you know, packaged it. Uh, initially, I wanted to um, Blair Witch the audience with this book the original title was simply the boogeyman a true story of small town terror um you know i there was no mention of it being a novel there was no mention of uh anything being fictionalized and i wanted to i wanted to, to kind of trick everyone um the way that the blair witch did to a lot of people um you know and i even had plans to like plant fake newspaper articles online um that when people googled some of the events it would lead to those and i also was going to hire someone to do a, a, an old-fashioned like early 90s website um, that looked like it had just stopped being updated at some point so I, I wanted them to be able to uh you know do some research and find reinforcement that that the stories were real um but once i sold it to simon and schuster and, and gallery books they you know they, they kind of nixed that idea um, which is probably smart. Um, and, and they had me put a novel on the front and a disclaimer in there. So, you know, but it's still, it's still so many people will say they've stopped reading various times to Google things. And uh, it's not until they get to the end and they read the afterward that they realize, okay, there's nothing out there to find. So, so you're not alone. <laughs> I looked everywhere. I was uh -huh. probably that lady. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. um, where did you get the idea? Did you have this idea of a boogeyman first or like melding? Well, you said like the Blair Witch Project, like, and that was such an iconic movie for found footage and right. it kind of sweeps the nation. Everyone was really convinced it was real. I, I think I was in third grade. There was a slumber party. I cried. I wanted to go home. Um, <laughs> and um, um, but to get that feel in a novel is so great. I, I got the advanced review copy. I was really lucky. And I read straight through nine hours. I could not put it down. Wow. And the wow. reality of it was so gripping. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, you know, the idea came from there was back in the 80s in Edgewood, which is the town I grew up in. Obviously, there, there was a and I talk about this in the after where there was a, there were a series of break ins. Um, most of the time, not actually break ins. I just entered through unlocked doors and windows. 
and an unknown assailant male, um, you know, in his thirties, um, he was going into houses at night and he was caressing like either the hair or the arm or leg of, of sleeping women. And, um, when they woke up, you know, and startled, um, he would just take off and, and disappear into the night. And he did this over 30 times and was never caught. And I, I just remember at that time, how much it changed the town. You know, it was almost like being in, uh, um, my own version of Scream, you know, the way they started talking about curfews and uh, people were buying guns and, and alarm systems. And back then they were buying like dead, you know, extra deadbolts for the doors and extra security for the windows and motion detector spotlights and things like that for the yards. And, and I always thought, you know, there's a great story there because I, I was waiting for those crimes to escalate. I mean, I'm, gl I'm glad they didn't. And I'm glad my book is fiction. But to be honest, I, I, you know, a lot of us were kind of waiting because that seemed to be the next step is for those crimes to get worse. Um, but they did finally catch the guy like, I think like seven or eight years later in Baltimore City and for a different, completely unrelated crime. And uh, they tied him back to these to these. But yeah, that's where the original idea came from. I just, you know, I thought, well, what if they got worse? And, and chasing the boogeyman was my answer. Well, that was actually my my next question was about the Phantom Pondler and if he had um, inspired the story. And I have to say, reading the novel, uh, the Phantom Pondler was my number one on the fictional like right. <laughs> list. Like yeah. like maybe like this can't be real, but but it was. And um, I I was also curious if that had set the kind of mood in the town that you portray in Chasing the Boogeyman with everyone on edge, like you just said. Yeah, there were a lot of rumors, you know, people setting traps outside their houses and and we didn't know what, you know, to believe them or not. But the bottom line is that they were being talked about and, you know, there were people talking about is there a similarity between the victims and that really didn't come to anything. But, yeah, the fan of Fondler was very real. Um, you know, you can Google that and find plenty of information about that in Edgewood, Maryland. But, uh, yeah, just all the other stuff I made up. Well, I'm, I'm glad they they caught the guy. Um and you're a fan of true crime. Um, aside from the Phantom Bondler, was there any kind of fictional villain or character or case that had, um, or a true story of a killer that had inspired your idea of the Woody? Um, Man? just yeah, I, I've been a true crime fan for a long time, and you know, I've always had a kind of a warped interest in, in you know, a fascination slash really you know genuine fear of, of serial killers of human monsters you know most of my short fiction is psychological as opposed to you know supernatural and a lot of it is is based on you know kind of the monster who lives next door and and, and drives a decent car and goes to a job every day from nine to five and but he happens to you know he's, he happens to be wearing a mask and underneath that mask is is a monster you know um so, yeah, and, and I've always wanted to write something, you know, about the so-called boogeyman, you know, so th this was my perfect chance. And, uh, yeah, I, uh, you know, it, it's just a very traditional kind of a campfire scary story, and I had a lot of fun with it. I'm a huge Stephen King fan, but it's the non-supernatural horror that is the scariest because there's so much reality in it and that stuff happens. Right. And, and I think I was aware of that from a really early age. You know, I was always aware of the fact that, you know, I lived in this this pretty quiet at the time, you know, a pretty quiet suburban neighborhood and, and people waved to each other. And, you know, they, everyone kind of knew each other, at least on, on several of the blocks and streets around my house. But I, I think I was always aware that you never know what goes on behind closed doors and behind those those pool tight curtains, you know, um, so, yeah, I, and I always kind of had that that dark warp side to me. So I was the one scaring my friends and telling them stories and saying, what if, you know, this happened? And, and again, that all, you know, kind of got poured into the book, too. So you were the one who had friends going home crying from your sleepovers? Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, you know what? Not crying, but I do know, like, telling my scary stories at night when we were walking, a lot of times I had, them. you know, Chiz, come on, Rich, stop, stop, no more. <laughs> And then, you know, the next night we'd be doing the same thing again. But yeah, they, you know, they were, we were all very, very close and, and you know, they, they enjoyed it. We all enjoyed being scared. Awesome. Um, there, there was a point in Chasing the Boogeyman and you described uh, your childhood bedroom going back there and you had a Salem's Lot poster on the wall. And were you a Stephen King fan as growing up? And did you ever oh, imagine yeah. you'd end up writing with him? Never. No, I, uh, I was a Stephen King fan from the very beginning. Um, uh, 
uh, well, not his very beginning, but like, uh, I think the first one I read was Salem's Lot. Um, I was the youngest of five kids and my parents were big readers. So there were books everywhere. And at some point I read Salem's Lot and then, yeah, I mean, my, my 10th grade English story, I tell the story a lot. He, uh, my 10th grade English teacher, rather, he, he brought in photocopies of the monkey from Stephen King when I was in 10th grade and we read it in class. And that was a, that was a, a huge kind of a door opening for me where I realized I'd like to kind of, I'd like to do this to people. I'd like to transport them to other places and times. And um, so, yeah, King has been a huge influence right from the beginning. And no, I never imagined in a million years that I'd work with him or that I would, you know, be friends with him or, or write with him. And even after, even as the business progressed and we had built, uh, uh, you know, a really strong working relationship that turned into a friendship, I still never imagined I'd, I'd be writing with him. It's it, an incredible to, to read your experience like that. How, like, you know, he's a poster in his bedroom and now he's working with the guy. What was oh, yeah. that? Like, I have to say also the monkey is probably my scariest Stephen King story. That that one was terrifying. Well, that's, I always tell people, I said it took a room of, you know, like 15 year old, you know, wise asses. And it, it made them, everybody shut up and was just kind of wide eyed. And, and, and as we were reading the story to each other. So that, that was the, when we were finished, there was this hush in the classroom. And I just remember thinking that's, I want to do that to people. So. Yeah. I mean, I, I was literally the kid walking around with a Stephen King paperback in my back pocket, you know, um, or sitting up in a tree reading, you know, a Stephen King paperback. So, yeah, I, I got very lucky, obviously. And um, how, how did you first get in contact with Stephen King? Was it through Cemetery Dance? Yeah, I just from the very beginning, I sent, you know, I sent him that first issue some at some point after it came out in December. I I threw it in an envelope and sent it up to Bangor, Maine to his office. And, uh, you know, I'm sure with a, a letter saying how big of a fan I was and, you know, how much he had, his work had influenced me. And um, yeah, just from the very beginning, I sent him every issue of the magazine. I, I sent him, started sending him the books when we were publishing them. And at some point he sent me a, a story called Chattery Teeth for the magazine. Um, that led to other stories, you know, I think mostly reprints for the next few years. And then, you know, a, a bit later, uh, his assistant sent me in the manuscript for From a Buick 8 and asked if we wanted to publish a limited. Um, and that kind of started the book relationship. And it just went from there. I mean, um, you know, I, I would send him packages of the books we published and, and he was very kind would you know, send thank you notes. And, and uh, then I met him at a couple publishing parties that that he actually invited me to. And uh, yeah, and it kind of just went from there. So it was yeah, it was strictly just me sending him everything I did and, and saying, Hey, you you know, without you, I wouldn't be doing this. So, so yeah, we've, we've known each other for a long time. That, that's, that's incredible. And um, so the next book um, you and him are co-writing on coming out Gwendy's final task and you had collaborated, collaborated together on Gwendy's button box. Can you tell us how that came about? Um, he, we were just, we were email, we email and, and text a lot. And it's usually just more about baseball or our dogs or family stuff or movies and books a lot, you know, but it's, we don't usually do any kind of business, you know, um, direct. I, I, you know, I deal with, with his uh, agent for that. And um, well, one day we were just talking about collaborations and round robin projects. And somehow he mentioned that he had a story that he had started that he had never been able to finish. And um you know, just talk, talking back and forth about it. And he sent it to me the next day. And, and that's kind of how it happened. And, uh, you know, we didn't know what, what we were going to do with it. We didn't know if it would end up being a short story or a full length novella like it was. Um, so we just had fun with it. And then when we were finished, we kind of said, well, what do, what do you want to do with it now? And that's where the little book came from. And then the second one and this third one, you know, was Steve's idea. And he came to me and uh, essentially just said, you, what do you think about this? And uh, you want to go, you know, do it again. And yeah, you know, this, the third one's a full length novel and I'll be out in February. That, that's so exciting. I wanted to ask you a little bit about Gwendy's Magic Feather, also the second book. Um, Stephen King gave you poetic license for Castle Rock and to just explore the town. What was that like? Well, what's interesting is I, I didn't, I, I honestly, when I went to Steve with the idea for the second one, we had never talked about a sequel or anything like that. So I wasn't pitching him for a sequel. I went to him and, and essentially said, hey, I, I had a dream last night. This is what I think Wendy's been up to. 
since the first book. And he wrote me back, he emailed me back and he said, uh, that is a terrific idea. I love it. Um, I'm going to be busy with Holly Gibney for the foreseeable future. You should write it. So I wrote him back and I just said, really, you know, should I go ahead? And he's like, yeah, go for it. Now I took this as, because we collaborated on the first one and, and we, you know, sent it back and forth to each other several times. I took this as, okay, well, you write the first draft, Rich, and I'll come back and, 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 you know, make you look really good. Um, but that wasn't the case. I ended up writing, you know, the first and kind of going over it and writing the first and second draft. And I sent it to him and he really liked the book and, it's, and came back and, and said, Hey, you know, this is all you, if you want, I'll give you an edit. You know, uh, I'll go through and edit the manuscript, but this one's, you know, all your story. Um, so I was shocked and, and I was really upfront and honest with him. I was like, Steve, I would not have, I probably would not have done a lot of the things I did had I known I was flying solo. Um, like, you know, bringing Castle Rock back to life and bringing, you know, Sheriff Bannerman back into the picture and just a lot of the things I did. Um, so, yeah, he did give me poetic license. I just didn't realize that it was all me at the time. So, yeah, that's that's a true story. And he, he gave me a great edit. And um, and and the, one of the most kind things he did is he wrote an introduction. So because he knew I was a little bit worried that I was going to get a lot of uh, who, who the hell do you think you are writing about Castle Rock all by yourself? Um, so I think that's that's kind of where his willingness and, and generosity came in to write that introduction. Well, I know reading the two books, it was it was the transition was flawless. I couldn't tell like Stephen King had written part of this one and he hadn't in this one. It it all flowed really well. So thank you. So um, Gwendy's final task, Stephen King approached you about the third book. Was it collaborated in a similar way? Yeah, I mean, longer sections than than button box, obviously, because it's, you know, the third one's longer than the first two combined and then some. Um, so we, we traded much longer sections. Um, but yeah, I mean, he, he it, you know, I still remember it was a Sunday evening and he, I started getting texts and it was they were about Gwendy and and the more texts I, I received, the more excited he seemed to be. And uh, by the time we were finished with that that exchange, we had we had decided, oh, you know, we're going to block some time and we'll write this. Um, so, yeah, it was a surprise. We kind of went from zero to 60 miles per hour in the space of, of a half an hour one evening. Um, yeah. And then we, we blocked the time and we were trading, you know, big sections of text and we didn't really give it just like with book, button box. We didn't, even though this was a much larger framework, we didn't, you know, give anyone real direction. We didn't say, okay, this is what comes next. You know, there might've been a time or two where we where one of us or the other said, uh, you know, th I thought possibly this could happen, but we just gave each other complete freedom and trust and, and just rolled with it and uh, no outline, no, uh, like I said, not, not even bullet points or plot points to kind of follow. Um, so it was fun. It was challenging. And it was to me, I, I remember I texted him one night and I said, this, this feels like what a true collaboration should be. You know, um, it's challenging. It's fun. It's uh, entertaining because I'm reading what you wrote and then I get to take it wherever I want it. And uh, I send it to you and then you get to take it back wherever you want and, you know, in your turn. So yeah, it was a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, just just a great experience from start to finish. So the fan speculation about Gwendy's final task has been, is that the Dark Tower on the cover? And perhaps how we visited Castle Rock, are we going to be visiting the Dark Tower? And there's also questions about uh, Richard Ferris. The, um, uh, you know, the only thing I'll say at this point is that it, uh, you know, that was one of the coolest things about this book is that we really did tie it into a, a lot of different aspects of the Stephen King universe. There's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of crossover in, in that universe of his. And again, the fact that I got to, to play in that sandbox was just unbelievable. I mean, the first one I couldn't believe right in the first sentence of the story when I read it it, you know, it talks about how it's in Castle Rock. And I was like, oh my God, I'm going to Castle Rock. And then the second one by myself I did. And then this third one, we, like I said, we cross over into a lot of different parts of his world. And, you know, I can say, because it's, it's, uh, I've already talked about it, but, you know, not only in Castle Rock for this third one, but we're in Derry for quite a bit. And that's, that's my favorite, you know, it is my favorite Stephen King book and Derry is my favorite haunted town. So the fact that we get to go back to Derry is, uh, 
is unbelievable. And that was actually initially my part in the book where I took us there. And I remember thinking, oh, he might not like that. And I actually told him, if you don't want to go back there, don't worry about it. Just, um, you know, write it, rewrite, rewrite it as someplace else. And, and he actually really liked it and, and just embraced it and made it even better. I love that we're visiting Derry again. I mean, Derry gets mentioned and we're like, okay, we're in for a wild time in this town. You just don't know what's yeah. going to happen. Um, um, and I, so, as you said, the multiverse, I so enjoy the Easter eggs and I really enjoy the Easter eggs and chasing the boogeyman as well. Um, the hopscotch grid. I was like, you know, what's oh, funny God. is, is, and, and I, I said this, uh, someone, someone referenced it for the first time last week and I, and I responded to it and, and I, I didn't know whether they believed me or not, but it was the truth. Um, what's interesting is I was so into the story that the hopscotch grid um, and the pet poster I didn't even realize till after the fact what I had done. And, and I actually, again, you know, um, thank God for texting and the phone. I actually texted Steve and I said, listen, <laughs> I did this and I didn't even have a clue that I did it. And I said, I could change it. I said, or we could consider it an homage because I said, I personally, I love the fact that it's in there. And I said, and here was my reasoning when I did it, you know, especially the hopscotch grid, I kind of went into the reasoning with him. And he's like, no, I love it, you know, leave it alone. So, you know, I had his blessing with that. But yeah, there, I definitely threw some Easter eggs in there. You know, the jazz club that burned down um, and when I'm talking about the, the um, you know, the history of Edgewood and I'm talking about the African-American section. And I threw a few things in there that uh, that were, you know, just kind of my nods to to uh, to the big guy. I, I remember I was reading those parts of my car. We are the low men responsible here? What's going to happen? Because yeah, like the missing per, um, person poster and missing pet. Have you seen this dog? Right. And the hopscotch grid. I was thinking back to the low men in yellow coats. Everything. No, absolutely. Natural. Yeah, because I actually thought I'm like, wait a minute, eighty eight. No, you know that those books weren't out yet by Steve, so I couldn't even c- kind of have a a mundane explanation for it. So yeah, I just went with it, and uh, like I said, I had his blessing, so I was I was good to go. I wonder if that was a subconscious thing. Like you spent so much time reading in his universe, you didn't even realize. Or oh, it had to be. I mean, it had to be. And and to be honest, I I only remembered for sure the pet thing. I I I, I texted Bev Vincent in there somewhere too because he's my you know he's the supreme Stephen King expert and a good friend and uh, and a really good writer and. So I bug him a lot with uh, with the Gwendy books, um, but this you know this was different. And I and I remember texting him and saying, "Was there a hopscotch grid in there?" So that part was definitely subconscious. And actually, they both were. But like I said, I, I kind of came out of there, swam out of that place, and realized, "Oh wait a minute, the pet poster." But it was the hopscotch grid that that uh, had the most meaning for me. There was also a nod to Gwendy's magic feather in there. Um, I think it was you in the book who had bought the feather for what was it, twelve dollars? The magic feather. Yeah, and that's true. That's a true story. I. Uh, yeah, my sisters. You know, for years they made fun of me because that was the whole. You know, that was the joke. Is hey, you know, little rich saved all his pennies and dimes and nickels for this vacation and uh then he blew you know all of it almost uh, the you know within it, it, no exaggeration it was within 10 15 minutes of getting out of the car and i bought this magic feather and they're like oh my god you did what so yeah when Gwenny's magic feather came out i was able to, to go to my sisters and be like see maybe it really was magic um but yeah that was a true story so i wanted to include that in the book and, and get it down and I was curious about that after reading it and chasing the boogeyman. That's there an yep. actual magic feather. Yeah. True story. Yep. So um, what do you like to, um, do you have any horror favorites you can tell us about? Like what you like to watch and read in your downtime? Um, how many staples you keep going back to? Yeah. I mean, uh, my comfort stuff is, is our, our books like it or Salem's lot. My, my oldest son, uh, recently read Salem's Lock for the first time and several times throughout the book he would talk to me about different things or he would text me a line or two from the book and I was by the time he was finished I was so jealous of him having the experience for the first time that I was like all right I'm gonna go back and reread it um, like I said it is is the old chestnut for me it's the it's my favorite but yeah I you know I'm surrounded by him and I'm fortunate that I get galleys a lot of times or I get advanced manuscripts so 
you know, um, but downtime has been scarce lately. So I'm just kind of humming along and, and, and doing what I can to keep up with things. And, uh, but it's, you know, it's October. So I'm watching, you know, I have the TV on in the background. I know I've seen, let's see, you know, the crazies scream three, uh, Halloween, the original, which is my favorite, um, and a bunch of other horror films that have just been on over the, you know, and they will be for the rest of the month. They're always, you know, on AMC or one of the cable channels. I, that's, I think that's one of the main things I miss about having cable. Everything's gone to streaming lately, but yeah. Yeah, it's always a fun time around Halloween. Um, yeah, I'm, you're, you're surrounded by it, which is kind of cool. It's very cool. And, um, you have done some screenwriting also. I was curious if there could be a movie in the works for Chasing the Boogeyman. Yeah, I hope so. I, I'm not real interested in writing the script because um, I'm, you know, working on other things, but uh, we definitely have a, a lot of interest in, in Boogeyman and I imagine we'll, we'll do a deal sometime soon. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, it, again, I haven't thought too much about it, but uh, I, I was at the old Edgewood public library yesterday with my son. Uh, they had, they had, they've done this beautiful display window for uh, chasing the boogeyman. And we were talking to some of the librarians and talking about my memories there when I was a kid and uh, uh, the, the movie, uh, you know, and they were just talking about how excited the town is and how many people are, have the book on reserve in the library. And uh, you know, the fact that so many people are talking about it, and then a movie came up and I just thought, wow, you know, that would be neat for the old hometown because, you know, as you know, you know, uh, readership is a drop in the bucket compared to viewership so many people you know watching movies these days so yeah hopefully it happens and it, it, it would be uh you know it would be a strange thing to see someone playing me on the screen but it, it'd be fun <laughs> definitely fun so did the library forgive you for stealing the bit of bigfoot fur you know what out of all the things we talked about i, I forgot to uh to bring that up because you know i told them like oh that you know because it's been expanded since then and the the original part of the library are now offices and stuff and i you know so i'm pointing kind of to the general area and i'm like you know there's where the periodicals used to be and i used to grab books and just take them over there because they had the most comfortable chairs and you know I, we were talking about things like that and and i completely forgot to say you know the bigfoot story is true 100 percent true that happened and it happened in this building oh my goodness that that was that was another really fun one I could see my dad doing something like that absolutely um, um are there any other projects currently of going on with Cemetery Dancer oh uh, you know with Cemetery Dancers there's a million things you know we're, we're uh because of because of the whole uh you know because between COVID and then a lot of uh supplies being behind and 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 you know um employees too there you know uh, our, both of our printers are way backed up so we've got you know I, I think last count was something like a dozen or 14 books at press right now um so yeah there's always stuff going on there i'm working on a couple stories and and, and the new book which i just started so i can't really talk about those but uh, yeah and you know we're always working on uh, something and my son and i are working on a movie together you know writing a script and so yeah it's it's uh it's busy as usual that's, that's fantastic. I, I can't see, I can't wait to see what else you guys have in the works. Yeah, I should uh, be able to talk about something soon, which I'm, I'm, which I'm excited to do. But uh, until then, I kind of have to just be quiet and keep doing my October thing. Can I ask you about one of the um, weekly prizes from October Madness? And that is mm -hmm. that you're going to choose two people to appear in a short story. Yeah, you know what, I've, I've read where authors have done this forever, and I've always thought, that's cool, and I've never really had the, the uh, vehicle to offer it where, you know, it made sense, so this kind of seemed perfect, and, and I think I'll do one for a novel, you know, at the end of the month, probably, but yeah, I just thought, why not, it's fun, you know, uh, as long as it doesn't feel forced, and, and you know, it's authentically, um, you know, woven into the story, then yeah, why not? It, it makes some people happy. And, uh, you know, usually I'm looking around, you know, at book spines or opening up, you know, magazines and looking for names for characters anyway. So it works out. That, that's so fantastic. I mean, um, when you think of creative writing, I'd never even thought of it in that capacity um, of just taking real people and mm -hmm. kind of putting them on an adventure and kind of chasing the boogeyman. Gave, I, I wonder how many people were inspired by that. I was like, maybe... Maybe I could do something like that. It was, yeah, it was really it'd be interesting. 
That's, yeah. I've, you know, there's, you know, I've had people say, I wonder if there'll be more books like these and stories like these that'll pop up. And I, I think so. I mean, not, not because of me so much as because of the success of the book. I would think that, you know, when I sent it out originally for blurbs from a handful of writers, yeah, a couple of them came back and were like, ah, you know, I should have thought of this because I have a great story to tell. So yeah, I, I think we'll see more. I think it's fantastic. I know I'm always wondering, I'm like, where do they make up all these names from? Like, it's just, yeah. you know, so many in like, you know, course of a novel, first and last names, but that that's really, it's an awesome concept and it's so cool for your fans that they could possibly be part of that. Yeah, they seem excited by that one. That's that prize. And uh, what is the best way for people to keep up with you and what you have coming up in the um, works? Yeah, I mean, I, I had to be kicked into social media. I mean, dragged into social media, uh, kicking and screaming years ago. Because um, I don't really go to conventions. I don't get to Raiders conferences. And, uh, you know, I'm usually pretty much a home guy. And uh, but once I did, I actually really enjoyed it. I, and I was like, who knew? Um, so, yeah, I'm on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and have a great group of readers and, and people who, who interact. And, and they're very active and they're very kind. And, you know, usually if some you know, weirdo pops up his head and, and isn't kind and everyone kind of, you know, drums them out. And, you know, but I, I mean, that's the thing I've had a lot of writers and, and creators tell me, you know, uh, that social media drives them crazy. And I've just been like, I've had the best luck because in 10 years or whatever it's been, you know, I can count the people on one hand who I've had to like block, um, just seem to have a really good group of people and, uh, we enjoy each other's company and, and, you know, it's books and movies and family stuff and they know who my dogs are and how my kids are doing. So yeah, it, it's, it's fun. I enjoy it. That's fantastic. Yeah. It's been so great to see you interact with your fans on chasing the boogeyman. And, um, it's been great talking with you today. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for asking me. This is great. All right. Thank you. Thank you.